Today's podcast is brought to you by Anchor. And if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, let me tell you, it is the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. So download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I can't wait to hear what you create. Caregiving is a constant learning experience. Vivian Frazier. Hello, truth seekers. You are listening to the Welcome to Your Life podcast. I am your host, Renee Reed. Welcome to Your Life is an Atlanta-based lifestyle podcast for women, helping you to live the life you deserve. Yes, you can get organized, live a balanced life, and get rid of your belly fat. If you're looking for tips on how to energize your relationships, faith, wellness goals, and parenting, you've found your tribe. Welcome home. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe. And for those of you with a little extra change in your pocket, please consider becoming a monthly donor. Your gifts help to sustain our community and provide for future episodes. Today's guest is Dr. Erica Gamble, a 15-year veteran in the field of human resources. In this episode, Dr. Gamble provides us with some field-tested tools and tips to safeguard our employment while caring for a sick child or other relative. If you or someone you know is responsible for the day-to-day care of a relative, who has a psychiatric diagnosis or physical disability, today's episode will be a life changer. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. So today we are talking with Dr. Erica Gamble. Dr. Gamble has 15 years experience in the field of HR or human resources. She is an author, a life coach, entrepreneur, college professor, yoga instructor. Dr. Gamble, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So today we are delving into how to practice self-care and also protect your employment if you find yourself caring for a chronically ill child or other family member. But before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your work in human resources, and why you chose that field of study. Okay, so um, I am a college professor um, currently. But prior, well, not prior to that, but the start of my career was actually in human resources. Um, I started my career in human resources in about, in, in around 19, I think 98, 99, something like that. And actually it was by mistake that I actually entered into the field of human resources because I didn't know what it was. So when I was signing up for some college courses at the time, I I believe I was working on finishing up my bachelor's degree. Human resources was one of the um, one of the uh, careers or whatever that you could choose if you were interested. And so I just chose it. Really didn't know what it was. And so once I started um, studying what human resources was and what it meant and the impacts that it could have on an organization or on the lives of people who work within an organization, then it became interesting. It did not become interesting until I actually started practicing. And one of the reasons is because human resources in theory 
is not what human resources is in reality. So a lot of the things that you learn um, out of the book about how to uh, deal with certain aspects of human resources and what it actually means and what it looks like is not necessarily the reality of it. And so it wasn't until I landed my first job in human resources, which was actually an administrative assistant in the recruiting department, is where I started. And that's where the impact actually started happening because I realized that I would actually be impacting people's lives. So, you know, that's really um, how all of that happened. And so I'm glad that it did because I do believe, and I still believe that human resources is a great career field for um, anyone who is interested in making change, impacting people's lives, and just making change within the organization that they support or if they're considering their own business. It's also great information that an entrepreneur or business owner would need to know in order to successfully run their, their company. That's great. And you said something really interesting about how uh, this is a field that impacts the lives of people. And I don't think a lot of us think of it that way. I mean, the human resource manager is usually the person who takes your application um, and does the interview process, but you don't think of the entire role that a human resource department has um, to the health of an organization. Yeah, that's true because I think times have changed from, you know, that human resources used to be called personnel. And so just as you described, what you just described used to be the personnel department. So that person would be the one to take the application, do the interview, do the paperwork, fill out the tax forms, do the payroll. That person was doing everything. And then around 2000, early 2000s, you know, HR started to evolve where there, you know, it became like, okay, there is not one person who can do all of this. We need to have someone who is specialized in recruitment. We need to have someone who specialized in benefits. We need to have someone who is specialized in employee relations and um, compensation. All of those things are specialized, and not every one person is able or capable of doing that. And so I think as a result of a lot of things that start happening in the workplace, HR, the, the, the trends of HR had to change because you needed to have someone who would really be specialized in a particular role in order to deal with particular situations. Wow. And that's so true because you are dealing with employees, but these employees are part of families and what happens in those families usually comes to work uh, with the employee. They bring, you know, sometimes it's unavoidable that they bring uh, good things and bad things into work. And because we spend so much time during the day, you know, 40 plus hours a week, um, have you found that the human resource department is able to or has, um, you know, implemented plans to really care for the employees and to help them to manage their lives outside of work as well as uh, within the scope of their employment? Um, I think the answer would be yes and no. So. I think the yes part of that would be there are human resources managers um, who are seasoned and have been around and understand the impacts of, you know, people and understand that, yeah, people spend more of their time at work than they do at home. And that also, too, I think a lot of it is if you as a human resources manager have personally had your own issues and situations, then you kind of know, okay, so I've been there. You know, what did I do in this situation? Now how can I potentially help this employee? The no part to that would be, and no disrespect to the millennials or, you know, the upcoming 
you know, uh, people who are entering into certain fields, but I do think that a level of experience and expertise can change or be the deal breaker in whether or not an employee um, is able to keep their job, retain their job, or deal with of the aspects of um, managing home and work. And so, you know, a part of that, too, is, you know, employees have to be made to feel comfortable enough to go to the HR manager and share any information that could potentially impact their employment. So if the employee is not feeling that level of comfort or if the HR manager has not opened the door and invited them in, then there's going to be um, the opportunity for things to start shifting because employees will then determine, they'll make the decision based off of that manager's behavior, whether or not they want to share or whether or not they feel like this person is willing to help them or can help them. Wow, and you said something really great about employees feeling that they are, have been invited to come in and actually share, which would require you know, a level of trust that I, as an employee, um, am not sure that I would feel, uh, you know, with my employer or former employers. Uh, but just to put what we're talking about into some in perspective, um, let's throw some numbers in here. So according to the Pew Research Center, just over one of eight Americans age 40 to 60 is both raising a child and caring for a parent. In addition to, between, in addition to that, between seven to 10 million adults are caring for their aging parents long distance. And the U.S. Census Bureau statistics um, paint a pretty bleak picture because they are estimating that by 2030, there will be over 70 million um, people over the age of 65 or 65 or over, which means that we will have a whole generation of women and men, uh, but mostly women, caught between raising uh, their children, and in some cases, their grandchildren, and caring for an elderly parent. So do you think that the field of HR, are they ready for those numbers? Um, so I think those numbers are realistic, number one. And number two, I think they are very alarming, given the fact that, um, you know, today the difficulty in just finding resources for uh, parents to be able to, you know, find adequate care for a parent, for a child, and still come to work and be productive. So to answer the question, do I think they're ready for it? No, because I, I believe that the numbers are really, really rapidly changing um, as, as this trend we're starting to see is happening. And number two, I feel like it could be addressed more openly and HR could be prepared to handle it more if, if they were willing. And when I say they, because it doesn't mean that everybody is not, but HR managers have to take on the responsibility to do the research, to find resources that are available for the employees and bring those resources to the table if they want to have a productive workforce. Part of the, the issue is, is that you're dealing with a lot of different people, a lot of different generations in the workplace. So you have examples of people who have no idea that you can even get benefits around elder care. There are people who have no idea that you can get benefits that, you know, take care of a person with, uh, that may be diagnosed with cancer or other things. And so education really is the key in this area because you, you have people when they're faced with these situations, the first thing that they do is panic. The second thing that they do is panic. And then lastly, they, right. they make impulse decisions on 
you know, well, what should I do, what shouldn't I do? And then they start talking amongst themselves and to their friends and to people who have no knowledge of what's happening in their life. And so you start getting a, a lot of bad advice, and then you start making decisions that don't make sense. So I, I, I personally believe that there's tons of opportunity out there for managers and HR managers to come together to say, hey, our workforce is not productive. Part of the reason is because I'm hearing that some of these employees are dealing with, you know, parents. Some of these employees are dealing with sick kids. Some of these employees are dealing with sick spouses, whatever the situation is. And then, again, invite them to have a forum. They don't necessarily have to disclose personal information. However, you can share information that, could potentially help somebody, and at that point, then that's where that trust is established because then they'll feel like, wow, she really knows a lot about this, and she's given us some insight, so maybe I can go to her and explain to her what's happening in my household. I think that's the key. That is the key. I totally agree with you. I think that, uh, you know, in order for businesses to grow there must be trust between the employer and the employee. Uh, and it's a two-way street. You know, it's, it has to be something that is um, cultivated and maintained and has to become part of the environment of the, you know, corporation or organization and should be the lifeline of the organization because where there is trust on both ends, I think that, you know, if if an employer is thinking of uh, how to put a dollar amount to that, uh, research shows that if an employee has trust in their employer, if they agree or align themselves with the uh, vision of the employer, you have a not only a healthier workforce, but you have a workforce who will work for you and do what needs to be done in order to bring the vision to fruition. But um, most times, and I don't know if you agree, but um, most times you see employees just going to work and punching a clock and not really thinking of themselves as part of the overall uh, vision or the overall success of a company. And maybe because they weren't invited, you know, to the table, like you said, so they don't, they feel they don't have a say in how things are run, or maybe because um, they don't trust that what they say or the input that they're able to provide will um, be heard by upper management. So, yeah, I re- I totally agree with, with what you said. Do you yeah, think that's true. that, yeah, mm-hmm. so just to um, put, I don't know, is there a HR definition of what would be considered a chronic illness? Um. So not necessarily an HR definition. I think just an overall definition of the reality of what a chronic condition is because it's not something that can be changed. So, you know, realistically, a chronic condition is something that is really a, a, a condition or, or disease that is going to be long-lasting in its effects. You know, it's not – it's something that – um, it's, it's most often a person could be born with, but not all chronic diseases people are born with. Some of them um, actually come over time. But the term chronic is really applied when the course of the disease lasts for more than three months. So I think that, that kind of answers that first part of your question, like from an HR, you know, kind of standpoint. So when you think of common chronic diseases, you think of something that, okay, this is a disease that's going to probably be here longer than three months, probably longer than six months, and then you start going into years and then lifetime. You know, so, you know, many uh, common chronic diseases are things like arthritis, 
people don't think of that as a chronic disease. People think of that as, oh, just something that happens and it hurts and, oh, you have it. That's chronic. Asthma is a chronic disease. Um, you know, cancer, of course, sickle cell, um, you know, a lupus. There's so many chronic things that fall in the category of um, chronic diseases, and there's so many diseases that aren't talked about that HR may not even know or understand because it's not talked about. But, um, you know, and ultimately a chronic disease can become or can be a lifelong disease because the ultimate result of that is death. So, right. and then you, you, then that becomes a terminal illness. And uh, I like what you said about lasting more than three months or, you know, and I deal with or work with families who have children who have been diagnosed with either a physical or psychiatric disability. And these are disabilities that they, that are lifelong, as you said. And what I've found is that, and that's how this, topic even came about is because, um, you know, several of the families that I'm working with, you know, they're single parent households and they have used up their vacation and sick time because they have children who need care uh, or in some cases they have a child and a parent who they're taking care of. And so, you know, they're dealing with this and not having much, um, you know, sympathy from their employer. And so uh, I really wanted to, you know, get your expertise and find out, you know, how, how I can help them as a social services practitioner but also to get the message out to, you know, our listeners that there is something that they can do to protect themselves um, and to protect their employment. So what do you think um, the first thing that an employee should do when they find themselves in the position of being a caregiver for someone who is chronically ill? So I think the first step in all of this is that people have to not be afraid to ask questions and not be afraid to talk about situations that they're dealing with because if you don't disclose the information to your employer and if no one knows what you're dealing with, then no one can help you. So I think the first step is taking out the fear of, am I going to be judged? Are people going to talk about me? Is this going to be spread around the office? And and is everybody going to know? Because that's the first thing that I hear when I talk to employees in the past who maybe didn't tell me initially what was going on. They didn't tell me until it became a problem. And the first thing was, well, I, I didn't know how to, you know, really come out with it because I was embarrassed or ashamed or whatever whatever they feel. So the first thing is, and again, this is, all goes back to the trust, and sometimes that trust is not there, and sometimes that trust is not going to be there. But the, the, the person has to get over that and understand that whatever they're dealing with, they do have legal rights um, that can protect them and can protect them in their employment and there's also lots of resources that can be provided for them when they're dealing with and if they're dealing with things of that nature. So the first step is disclosure. And the best way and the most reasonable way to disclose something like that is in writing. Most often if you are a caregiver for someone, be it a child, mother, grandmother, sister, father, brother, whatever it is, because you can be the caretaker for anyone, if you're given that responsibility, then you should obtain documentation from their provider, their doctor, whomever is diagnosing the person with whatever it is, to put it in writing to say, this person is dealing with their parent, and as a result of this, their parent has been diagnosed with XYZ. This is a long-term chronic illness or something that will never go away. 
therefore the employee may need some reasonable accommodation. That's the first step. And then the second step is understanding what you may have to deal with. So when you're dealing with someone with a chronic illness or someone who is sick or whatever, terminally ill or whatever, you may not necessarily know what that looks like from um, day to day. So you don't know if you're going to need a day off a week, uh, uh, 30 days off a, a month. You, you don't know. So then you have to find out or ask or do your own research and look at what's out there. By law, there are rules that protect employees for um, family medical reasons. And so the Family Medical Leave Act, you know, that was enacted and put in place for people to be able to take off work and to take off from work to care for a loved one, family member, sick person, whatever, and not be penalized. So, you know, the Family Medical Leave Act was enacted in 1993, and that does, that's not that long ago. In, in reality, if we really think about it, it was, but it wasn't. There's so many people who still don't even know that that exists. And so, essentially, there are guidelines that you, you, you know, there are rules and regulations to this, and there are uh, some criteria that a person has to meet. And pretty much you have to have been on your job for at least a year, or have worked 1,250 hours in order to be eligible for protection under family medical leave. However, if you don't meet that criteria, you still need to go to your employer to ask, are there any personal leaves that can be taken until that time comes where you have reached um, the the hours and, and the time eligibility, or is there options such as telecommuting? Can, can I work from home on the days that, you know, I need to, you know, care for this person? Or can I um, make up time if I need to take off? Can I, you know, can I come in earlier or later or weekends? There are so many options and ways that, you know, this can work. However, it has to be a relationship, meaning that the employer has to be concerned and has, has to have, be pretty much invested but then you, as the person that's dealing with this, you also have to be invested as well. And you have to pretty much come to the table with the knowledge and knowing what your options are. And that now, is really uh, – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead because you probably are going to uh, – And I was just going to say, I think a lot of times what we don't do um, – is do our research. We don't do our due diligence. And then we're surprised by, you know, that call to the HR office or, you know, being put on um, a plan to get you back on track or, you know, uh, something of that nature. But if we do our research and if we're open, um, to, re, you know, understanding our role as an employee and also as a caregiver. Um, and, yes, it's, it's difficult and it's stressful and it's draining. But like you said, if we do our research, then we can find out what, um, what's out there to help us, what resources can we put in place to kind of ease our burden. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And part of the, the, you know, the one thing that we have to realize is it's our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the HR manager to know what you're dealing with at home. So it's really your responsibility. And part of that research is could be merely looking in the employee handbook. You know, how many times do we start a job or, you know, go into a, a new thing or organization and we haven't even read the handbook? We don't, we don't even know what's in there. We don't know what th types of things exist. Also, it may, it may not necessarily be in the handbook, but it may just require a conversation because there are alternatives, as I mentioned before. So maybe you don't meet um, eligibility for leave at this time, but there could be some alternatives that your manager can work out with the HR manager to help, you know, to resolve the issue. Because all in all, it's stressful. 
for both the employee, especially because of what they're dealing with, but then it becomes stressful for the manager and as well as the other employees because now the other employees may have to pick up the slack where they may have to, you know, and, and often uh, the other employees don't know your situation. So they just assume, oh, she never comes to work. He's never here. He always calls off. He's always out. You know, they don't know what's going on. So the impact of one person being out or two people being out taking care of a parent or a sick child, it becomes a trickle-down effect. And now the productivity and the morale are both low because people feel like, you know, nobody's coming to work and everybody's doing their own thing, and then it just doesn't look good. And that's going to happen, and it's not for the employee to disclose their personal information unless they choose to. And it's definitely the manager and the HR manager um, definitely um, won't or shouldn't be disclosing that information, but it does create stress in the environment. And I've seen it also create stress on the employee because, they don't necessarily want to share what's happening with their coworkers because they don't want people talking about them. And, you know, you got a sick kid or, you know, you, you got this that you're dealing with, so they don't want to be the talk of the office. So all of that stress then combined and coupled with the fact that you're taking off work, also a lot of it is you're taking off work and you're not getting paid because with family medical leave, there is not pay involved, you know. And so now, you you know, you're not getting paid but you have to take off. And so, you know, now we got all kind of levels of stress that are coming into play because of a situation. So I think the key overall is knowing you have to know what's available to you and know what your resources are first. You can't expect someone else to know them and present them to you. And then you have to be aware and ready to accept whatever they are. So with the, Family Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, how would you apply for that? And um, is it, do employees know that there's no um, pay associated with that? Or do they assume that they'll still be getting their regular pay while they're on leave? Or even how does that work? Are you able to take off a certain amount of time or just whenever you need it? Yeah, good question. So FMLA, if, if you're eligible for FMLA, so again, the criteria by law is you have to have worked there one year and you have to have worked 1,250 hours. Now, there are going to be organizations that don't necessarily stick by that rule. That's going to be individual. However, they should be sticking by that rule because it could trickle down other things. So it, it's something that really should be followed and it should be fair and consistent. So if you've met that uh, criteria, if you've met that, then you would um, complete an application with, you know, most, most often, depending on your organization, it's online, or you can go to your HR manager and let them know, I need FMLA paperwork. At that point, they will provide you with a packet of information that you would complete and then you would also, there's also a section on there for the doctor or the caregiver or whomever to fill out that, you know, they're um, actually justifying, you know, this is correct, this is the situation. They would fill that out, and then you return that form to your HR manager, and then they would, you know, determine approval. There, the leave is unpaid. So what FMLA is in place to do is protect your job. So what FMLA essentially says is this person has a family situation that they need to take care of. They have 12 weeks over the course of a year to take time off of work. So those 12 weeks can be either taken consecutively, they can be broken out week to week, they can be however you calculate the 12 weeks. So it's, it's just a matter of 12 weeks. Now, some organizations have 12 weeks in a rolling year. So then as, you, as time, you know, goes on, then you would reaccrue the time and it will roll back on and then it will keep going. So it really, really just depends on, one, how the organization is set up. Two, it's a big difference between mom and pop type companies and organizations because organizations like, you know, big organizations like, you know, um, 
I don't know, Bank of America or, you know, whatever, whatever, just big firms and big companies, they're going to pretty much follow the guidelines and the rules to a T because they have thousands of employees to deal with. If it's a mom and pop type company or small company or a small business, they may not be as strict on the rules. They may just be a little bit more lenient. You may be able to work something out, you know, and it's a little bit more less, um, less, you know, paperwork involved. But if so, it, so it's going to depend on who you work for. It's going to depend on the management team and the organization. But I would recommend to any employee that whatever agreements that you make with your manager, whether it's inside of the guidelines or outside of the guidelines, that you get everything in writing. Because I've also seen where managers and HR managers have made deals, quote, unquote, you know, with employees like, hey, you know what, you can just work the weekend since you can't come in during the week. Or if you miss two days, you know, a week, you can come in on the weekend. Then it becomes a problem with other employees or it becomes a problem or that employee is not following through with the agreement, then the organization wants to terminate. Well, you can't terminate somebody if you don't have grounds. If nothing's in writing, it's your word against mine, then, then, then it becomes situational. So I would recommend that anybody that's going through this, whether you're doing it the legal way through FMLA and paperwork and all of that, or whether you're making an agreement with your manager, supervisor, or HR, that you get some sort of documentation um, that speaks to whatever conversation that you have just to protect yourself. And would you agree that, um, you know, accumulating this paperwork, keeping track of it is, and keeping track of the time that you've used is also the employee's responsibility also that they should be keeping track of the time that they use and also keeping the HR manager or HR person that they are working with, um, keeping them abreast of what's going on, if anything has changed or if, um, you know, or if things are getting better, you know, do you think they should keep them in the loop? Absolutely. I, I think the tracking element of it is your responsibility as, as the person because HR is certainly going to track and keep tabs on whatever they need to, and you should as well. That way, if there's any kind of discrepancies, you can come to the table. You have your document. This is what I know I use. This is what you say I use. We can come together and figure it out. It is not the HR manager's responsibility to keep tabs for you and for you to go to the HR manager and say, oh, I didn't know I was out of time, or oh, I, I didn't know I used you know, 12 weeks already, or I didn't know I used six weeks. When? I don't remember taking that day. That's unacceptable because it's, at that point it's your responsibility to keep track of what you're doing. And also to your point, yes, I think as out of just, um, you know, disrespect, but just out of, you know, being courteous, you should let the HR manager know, hey, I, I don't think I'm going to be needing as much time or yet things are getting better. So I think, you know, this, I, you know, we may be able to close the case or we'll keep the case open, but I'll keep you posted because that's the opportunity to build trust because now the door is open. Now, you you know, you're able to, you know, go in there and you don't have to share. And, that, and that's the other thing I, I will uh, speak to in one second. Um, but then that trust is established where the HR manager is not or the manager is trying to hunt you down, call you, leaving voice messages, emails, and all of this stuff, and you're not responding then the trust is going to, that's going to, you know, determine everything because now it really looks like, okay, what are, what are we really doing here? If you really care about your job and you really care about this relationship, you would communicate. And so I've seen that too. I've seen employees totally take advantage of FMLA and time off because oftentimes they, they may need it initially for something, but then they keep it and then they just use it for their own personal time off use. And there are doctors out there who will sign off on FMLA paperwork for a small fee and will keep you out of work for a long time. So there's a lot of uh, illegal situations that have happened as a result of this, 
so that's why it is really important for the communication um, to happen if you care about, you know, keeping your employment and if you care about the relationship. Um, and so wow. and the second part I, w- I wanted to say is disclosing personal information. So while the HR manager will have the documentation, if it's signed off by a physician or a social worker or whatever the situation is, there's going to be personal information that is going to be shared on those documents. Um, And that's about the extent of where that should go. The HR manager should not be asking you personal questions about your situation. You should not be discussing personal uh, things about your situation. It gets very sticky, it gets very tricky, and it can backfire. I always warn employees to stick to facts, and only disclosed what's necessary. So, for example, my son has sickle cell. He had it at birth. And so, um, you know, for my employer, you know, I would have his doctor fill out the the information on, you know, the reasons why I needed to have FMLA. But clearly the diagnosis was sickle cell. We didn't go into personal things about what he needed, what we had to do, you know, what, you know, what we had to go through, what he had to, he had to see a social worker and he had to do this because that's not their business. All they need to know are the facts. The person has sickle cell, the person has cancer, the person has lupus, the person has arthritis, the person, whatever. But once you start disclosing personal details, sometimes those personal details can be incriminating, you know, and especially if the stories aren't always adding up. And we've seen a lot of that where the stories just don't add up. And so I think sometimes and people, you know, there are people who like to share and people just like to normally or naturally talk a lot and share a lot of details. But when it comes down to personal things like this and work, um, I always tell employees to err on the side of caution. Don't over-disclose information that's not necessary and keep it to a minimum. That's very important. Yes, so you don't have to bring in uh, treatment plans or, you know, paperwork from the psychiatrist showing the diagnosis or uh, anything of that nature. Is that correct? That's correct. You just need to have paperwork signed by whoever is signing off to your situation and simply stating what it is. So if the child is diagnosed with, you know, mental health or Asperger's or ADHD, whatever it is, that's all that needs to be put on there. They don't need to say that the child, you know, um, called into, to, uh, you know, uh, the school and threatened to kill everybody in there. They don't need right. to disclose that, you know, this child has, you know, sickle cell and, you know, needs a blood transfusion every two weeks and he needs three liters of blood and he no that's way too much first of all and then secondly you know most oftentimes the hr manager and the manager aren't medical they don't have a medical background so they're not going to understand much of it anyway unless they've dealt with it and um it's just not necessary it's, it's just not necessary to disclose that and that thank you for that because that is great information Um, And I think we do sometimes overshare because we're trying to, you know, just firm up our case and make sure that the HR manager understands how dire our situations are. And so sometimes we can overshare information um, that we really don't need to So that's very, I really like what you said. Just stick to the facts and um, make sure that your paperwork is documenting those facts. And that's all you really need to show them. Yeah, that's it. So you talked a little bit about the stress that um, the employee is feeling not just from, you know, the fact that they're dealing with um, their care role as a caregiver, but also um, the pushback they might be receiving from their coworkers. Um, how would someone who, you know, say you're 
someone who is trying to work your way up the corporate ladder and you find yourself in a situation where you are now a caregiver and you may need some time off to handle that obligation, how do you keep that forward movement um, in your career? What, what suggestions do you have for them? So unfortunately, people aren't <laughs> how can i how can I say this <laughs> you know th- th- so th- th- this this situation or any situation that you have as far as being a caregiver for someone should not be held against you, but unfortunately, because we have human beings that we're dealing with. And not everybody has a sense of, um, you know, I don't even want to say sympathy or empathy, but I feel like sometimes it's an opportunity for a person to penalize you or hold something against you because it's something that is really out of your control. So I'll, I'll use myself as an example. When I worked, um, I worked for Progressive in Cleveland. I worked for Progressive for over 10 years. The one thing that I made sure that I did with every manager that I had, um, because I had a lot of different jobs at Progressive, I went to them and shared with them exactly what I was dealing with in terms of caring for a child with a chronic illness, first of all. And then secondly, I had my documentation, you know, already in hand, ready to, you know, um, present. And then thirdly, I didn't take advantage of my time. So that was one way that, um, you know, I kept that to a minimum. But also, you know, I think it, it, it can often show just in the work and in, in your work ethic and then, you know, how you do things. So, for example, I was working my way up the career ladder at Progressive in Human Resources. You know, I started as an administrative assistant. Then I started, then I moved into a role as a recruiter. Then I moved over to benefits. And then I moved over to HR generalist. I made those moves all still while dealing with what I had to deal with at home, but at the same time, I didn't use what I was dealing with at home as a crutch for what I couldn't do at work. Because the difference is when my child was in the hospital or when my child needed to um, be at home or miss school, or what, I was still working. I was still doing what I needed to, to, to do to enhance myself and my career. I was still reading. I was still doing things. So I didn't let, because I needed to miss a week, meant that I couldn't do a project at work, you know, because I needed to take, no, I still did what I needed to do. And I think that holds true in anything in life. We always have setbacks. We'll always have setbacks, situations, trials, tribulations, and all kind of things that will come up. But that doesn't mean that we can't continue to push forward. Now, there may be situations where it may be a little bit more difficult depending on the severity of what you're dealing with, you know, and how you work around that. However, if having your job is important to you and if you need that job to pay the bills and you need that because that's your livelihood and that's how you eat, then you have to figure it out. And sometimes that may mean soliciting help from family members, friends, volunteers, other people to also help take some of the strain off of you if that's an option for you. I realize that's not an option for everybody. Everybody doesn't have family resources and help and support, you know, to help them along the way. And so if you don't, then I feel like that's an opportunity for you to maybe look into some resources or to try to get some additional help if that's possible. And so at some point, if that none of that is a possibility, then you may have to make a decision on whether or not you need to take maybe a temporary leave of absence or take a period of time off where you can maybe get a handle on things, get a handle on the situation, whatever you need to do so that when you, you know, then you can prepare to come back to work and when you're at work, focus on work. And then when you leave work, then you can focus on what's happening at home. So I think a lot of that depends on, A, the situation, of what you're dealing with, B, the severity of it, and then D, the level of support that you have versus the level of support that you don't have in order to help you move forward. I was just blessed. I'm not going to say I was lucky and 
I was just in the right place. After I was just blessed because the managers that I had, they not only understood, but they trusted me. And they trusted that if I said that, hey, I have to take off Wednesday to take my son to his appointment and I'll be gone, you know, most of the day. However, I'm still going to deliver on whatever it is that I needed to deliver or I'm still going to show up, you know, Wednesday night uh, once, you know, we get home from the doctor and I'm, I'm still showing up at the office or I still came in on the weekends or uh, the holiday, whatever I needed to do to build that trust and let them know, yeah, I do have a situation, but also I realize I have a responsibility at work as well. And so I, I like think what it lies you said. In. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I like what you said when you and then we were we've been talking about HR, but I like that you said you you know told you know explain to each of your managers, um, you know what was going on just so that they were kept in the loop, and should that be your first? Um, should that be the first person that you confide in about what is going on before you go to HR? Should you bring your manager into the conversation? Um, you should. You, your manager should be your first um, level of communication. But, you know, over the years, realizing that not everyone gets along with their manager. But when you have a situation like that, you kind of have to make a decision that you're going to get along um, because ultimately the HR manager still has to loop your manager in. So there's really no way around it. If you and your manager don't have a good relationship, but now you have a situation and you need to take some time off work, well, yeah, your manager has to know. And your manager is your first point of contact. That's the person that you need to communicate with when you're not going to be at work, when you need to take time off, when you can't come in. When things are going, you have to let your manager know. And so the HR manager's level of involvement really is only at the level of the paperwork, making sure that that documentation is there. And then the HR manager is also there to help with resources um, and, you know, to, to, and for guidance. But the HR manager is not the go-to for you to cry on their shoulder and, you know, whatever and, you know, this is what's happening. That's not the responsibility of the HR manager. And realistically, the HR manager is really also there to be that gatekeeper, too, and make sure that that manager is also being professional and handling the situation as it should be and, and all of that. So it's best to have a good working relationship with your manager if you have a situation because that's pretty much where it's going gonna, it's gonna to lie between you and the manager. Because your manager ultimately could be your greatest ally, um, you know, in making sure that you're able to keep your employment if the company feels that you are no longer bringing enough to the table in order to justify them keeping you on board. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Because they may say, well, you know, now it's – review time, annual review time. Now, keeping in mind that a medical leave of absence or family medical leave or disability, those types of things should not, first of all, should never be discussed in a performance review and shouldn't come up. But we're talking about human beings, and we're talking about people who judge and people who use things against you. And so because those things shouldn't be discussed, but, yeah, the organization could say, you know what, it's time to lay off some people. And uh, who do you suggest would be first on the chopping board? And if you don't get along with the manager, you haven't been uh, communicating with the manager, you know, there's problems, you know, all that, you're going to be on that list, you know, whether you have a situation or not. But if you're that person who's been communicating, you know, to your manager, letting your manager know what's going on, uh, bringing in the paperwork as you need to, but also making sure that you're doing your part, you know, then there's an the opportunity there for the manager to say, you know, you know, while, yeah, this person has some personal issues that they're dealing with and, you know, they do have an approved leave, but I do think that there's potential. I do think we could keep this person in despite their issues. This person could really be uh, impactful to the growth of the organization or this person could really help turn our department around, whatever it is. 
So communication is going to be the key. And there are some situations where none of that's going to happen. The person's going to say, get rid of her. She's just got too much going on, too many problems. Uh-uh, bye. Okay. <laughs> there's nothing we can do about that. You know, there, there's going to be some one-offs. There's always that. Mm-hmm. Nothing, it's not a, ever a perfect situation. But I think it's imperative that you do what you need to do to earn your own key. And I know that you are, uh, um, just to switch gears a little bit, um, a yoga instructor. Is that something that you started um, or practicing yoga as part of your own self-care when your son was ill? Actually, no. Um, I didn't. Actually, I didn't start practicing yoga until about seven or eight years ago. I wish that I would have known about yoga in the 90s um, because I do feel like that could have not just helped me. I think I feel like it could have helped him as well. Um, But, you know, and maybe as you know or, you know, some of our listeners, you know, African-American people weren't, you know, yoga wasn't talked about. It wasn't introduced in the community. It wasn't heard of. It wasn't for us. And it just wasn't. It just didn't exist. And so um, a part of the reason, you know, why I started yoga, I was introduced to yoga by a coworker of mine who, you know, she's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to a yoga class, or I think she was having a yoga party, some, something that I never in my life heard of. And I think she um, invited people, and, she, you know, she said, hey, do you want to go to yoga? And I'm like, what is, I don't know what that is. I, I was very apprehensive. And part of my apprehension was because of the preconceived notions, because I said, we don't do yoga. That's not what we do. So how am I going to fit to this? And I thought you had to look a certain way or be able to do certain things in order to practice. And so finally, when I went to the class, it was really the most, one of the most challenging things that I ever had to do physically, but then how it made me feel after it was over made me make the determination on that experience. And so I continued to go, even though it was very hard. I think that's the thing that people don't know about yoga. Yoga is very difficult. It's not yeah. easy. Um, it's, it, it can be, you know, one of those things where it, 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 it's very physical. And if you don't do something the right way, you could ultimately hurt yourself. And so I wanted to continue to experience how I felt after that first time. And that's when I started my journey uh, with yoga. And the other part to that is becoming a yoga instructor was that I wanted to, you know, use this as an opportunity to reach out to people who have the same apprehensions that I did and the same preconceived notions and, um, you know, people who, who don't even know what yoga is and what it means or any of that. Um, and so that's what really made me decide to continue to move forward in my practice Yoga definitely helps me to connect with me first, and it also helps me to become mindful of my thoughts, my feelings, how I approach things, and then introducing all of that into my own physical body. So I do feel like practicing yoga can help you, you know, gain a level of uh, body appreciation that you will never, ever experience. And so I wish... And and so I'm not going to say I wish part of my, I'm going to call it my ministry and my desires is to potentially reach out to parents who have um, children with chronic illnesses or whatever, you know, things that they're going through. You know, for me, like, you know, when my son was going through his treatments, you know, we would spend, you know, five to seven hours in the hospital at a time doing a blood transfusion. Well, mm-hmm that would have been a great time for me to pull away for an hour and go do a yoga class. You know, how right. great would that would have been? And then I could come back and be feeling good physically, but also being, you know, better able to help him. And so that's something that I would love to do is to, you know, pull parents away for a second, even the ones who may be dealing with a, a parent, an elderly parent, a chronically ill parent, husband, whatever, and, in the hospital settings, in whatever settings they're in, and just say, okay, we're going to take this hour and, and, and devote it to ourselves and just become better and balanced and 
you know, so that we can be better for the people that we're caring for. So that's my that's my uh, ultimate goal for my yoga journey. And I do feel like over time, you know, once we start getting out into the communities and um, introducing yoga and spending a little bit more time on educating people about what it really means and what it really does, I think we could, um, you know, see some difference and some impact for sure. I love what you said about, because my next question was about self-care, and I love what you said about, um, you know, you wish you had known that you could step away for a little bit to take care of yourself and then come back and be refreshed and be able to, you know, take care of him um, and to give him what he needs. I think a lot of caregivers forget that part. And so, you know, burnout is real. And all of the health conditions that come from being burnt out, you know, the emotional eating, um, the weight gain, the headaches, the chest pains, mm-hmm. those are things that we experience because we do not practice self-care. So. What tools or tips can would you suggest to those of us who are, um, you know, working or managing a, a career and trying to be a caregiver at the same time? You know, I, I think that no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what we're going through, if we are not 100% within ourselves, then we are not going to be able to effectively care for anybody else. Um, And that's a fact. So I think many of us can relate to or may know someone who has been struggling with a child or a husband or a parent, and they took care of that person and they did everything, and, and, and that's all they focused on, and then they ultimately ended up ended up needing some of their own care or fell ill or uh, something happened because their focus was – all on the other person and not so much on themselves. Dealing with a sick child and being at the hospital, being away from work was very stressful for me. And I always felt like I didn't have the additional time to go and work out or exercise or just take a moment just to breathe or even I didn't even take moments to pray because I didn't have the, I felt like I didn't have the time. I don't have time to stop and pray because I got to, deal with this child and I got to deal with this and I got to, I got to do this and I got to do that. But what I realized is that if I would have taken on the opportunity to even give myself 45 minutes to an hour per day, every day, how much more significant or how much more of a better caregiver that I could have been for my son. And I, and I think it's important that we do that. And part of it is, the introduction, because the hospitals don't probably have the resources to do that. They need people. They need volunteers. They need people to come in and say, hey, I'll do it. I'll come every day from 12 to 1 and do a yoga class for people who are sitting in the waiting room, waiting on somebody to come out of surgery, waiting on the parent to come out of here, waiting on the child to get the, you know. Somebody has to start, and we have to start somewhere and, and, and do it, and then we can, you know, see the difference in helping other people. I really feel like that that would be a huge impact and a huge turnaround. And I think even for the people that we're dealing with, if they're physically able to mm-hmm. also to take an opportunity to use that and care for themselves as well and introduce them to some things. It doesn't necessarily have to be the physical movements of yoga. It could be meditation. It could be learning how to meditate, you know, something as simple as meditation and sitting quiet, you know, quieting the mind and, you know, being still in the body. And that is, and I think one of the things that, you know, when we think of self-care, we immediately feel guilty, you know, for thinking of ourselves. You know, how can I think of myself when I have this child who is sick or this parent who is ailing? Um, You know, how can I possibly pull away for 45 minutes? But it's like you said, if I don't take care of myself, then I will end up needing care. 
and then where will I be? Because if I am the caregiver for this child or this parent, who is going to be the caregiver for me? And I think that yep. is a question that um, caregivers need to ask themselves and, you know, need to, like you said before, look in your community, you know, ask your HR manager, ask your church or your synagogue or your mosque, you know, where are the resources that will help me so that I can have some respite care, um, you know, someone to come in and help me to so that I can have some time to myself and recharge and re-energize so that I can come back and, and fight the battle um, and be prepared to fight the battle instead of, you know, battle fatigue, which is what a lot of people are facing right now. And yeah. uh, absolutely. Yep. So I you agree. have given us some really, really great information. I'm so, you know, thankful that you were able to be on with us today. Um, if someone wanted to get into the field of human resources, what are the steps that you would suggest they take? Uh, the first step is decide if you like people or not. <laughs> right. Because um, <laughs> if, if, you, if, if you're not, and I'm not saying that you have to be a people person, but you do have to, you have to be open. You have to be considerate. You have to want to help. You have to be resourceful. You have to be willing to sometimes do the work and do the footwork in that field. And sometimes the HR manager will wear so many different hats. You have to want and be willing to take that on. Otherwise, it'll just become a miserable job for you. It won't be like second nature or love or something that you can just do with your eyes closed. That's the first thing. The second thing is is that there are, of course, you know, degree programs in human resources there, everything from associate's degree on up to um, a doctorate degree in, in the field of human resources along with um, certification. So for me, you know, like I said, I kind of fell into it because after I got my associate's degree, I got my associate's degree in small business management, small uh, entrepreneurship, I'm sorry, in small businesses which I thought at that time, because this was, again, in like 1990-something, I'm like, what am I going to do with that? But <laughs> then I moved forward and got my bachelor's degree with a concentration in human resources. And, so, and then that really tied in with um, the degree. And then I, you know, moved into my, doctor, my MBA and, and on into my doctorate degree. So there's lots of opportunities. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my dog is barking. There's, uh, is that diamond? Of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. There's um, lots of opportunities um, for people to enter into um, the field of human resources and um, different aspects of it. Um, but I, I think doing some research and understanding what the expectations are, looking at job descriptions, maybe understanding what the role requires, maybe looking at, you know, a realistic preview of what an HR manager does and what he or she is responsible for would be a good way and a good introduction into the field and really to determine whether or not it's for you. Because I, I do know that the, the um, HR community has changed it is evolving. It's no longer just the standard person, you know, necessarily sitting in the office working nine to five. You know, there's lots of different approaches that HR managers take. HR managers are now training. They're doing training. They're doing development. Um, you know, they're tapping into so many other things as well. So it's really one of those things where it's, it's much needed. Diversity is definitely needed um, in the career. And it just really requires a special, you know, type of person to want to really take that on and um, make some change. So, Wow. And um, I think one of the things that you 
kind of glazed over, which I will uh, toot your horn for you, is that you were able to earn your MBA and your doctorate degree while taking care of not, you know, taking care of your son who was ill, but you also had another son. Um, and you were able to do that um, and raise them. They're, you know, grown up now, but... Um, I just want to applaud you for the for that work. If you know, and I think that you're a perfect example of what can be done if you you know do your homework, do your research, and really pull in the resources around you to help you achieve your goal. So yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I. I I appreciate that, and I will say it, it definitely wasn't easy. Um, it, it definitely wasn't easy. Um, it did not come with, um, you know, a, a lack of uh, sleepless nights and, um, you know, just a lot of heartache and a lot of struggles and just a lot of wanting to quit and all of that, you know, because it's just not easy. But, you know, it's worth it. and. Um, that's that's part of the reason why I do what I do and really want to help inspire and encourage people and let them know that they they can do it because, you know, I dealt with a lot of things and, yeah, having a child that's sick, um, you know, if you have a child that's sick, I don't know anything about having a parent that's sick because I didn't have to take care of a sick parent, but having a sick child and knowing that it's a lifelong illness, it never's going to go away. So at that point, I had to determine whether I was going to accept that or not, deal with it or not, and then how we needed to move forward because it was not—it was something that wasn't ever going to change. So my advice to anybody is, is that if that's your situation, you have to decide whether or not you're going to stay in it and never move forward or you deal with it and life has to go on. And so you still have to work towards the things that you want to regardless of any situation that you're dealing with, even if it's you. If it's you, if it's a spouse, if it's a child or a parent, you still have to make the decision to take care of you because I knew that if I would not have continued on and got my education and done the things that I needed to do, how would I be able to take care of my children? You know, and so that was a decision that I had to make, you know, in addition to dealing with that is, you know, okay, I still have to, take care of them, and I still have to be a resource to them and, and still need to do things and um, take care of myself and my life. So, yeah, that's why life coaching is so important and, you know, just reaching out and being an advocate in the community and, you know, all of that for people to see that there is hope and that it can, it can be done. And out of your, you know, taking care of your son and really volunteering with the sickle cell, um, foundation, I think both in Cleveland and in Atlanta, is that correct? You, that is correct. Um, you wrote a book. So tell us a little bit about your book and how, you know, where did that, um, the concept for the book come from and how can we get a copy of it? So I did. I wrote this children's book, and honestly, I tell people this all the time, I wrote that book in like five minutes. And (laughs) it was just, I remember, it was just like one day I was just sitting at my desk, and I said, you know, I had the idea to put a children's book together. The reason for the idea was because, again, when my son was going through his situation with his chronic illness, I often always went to the library to look for resources, to kind of help explain his situation to him in a childlike manner. And there were no books about sickle cell, no children's books. Everything was adult books. It was just all these words and medical terms and all of this stuff. And there were no children's books. And so for a long time I thought about it. I'm like, you know, this just doesn't make sense. Nobody's talking about this. That kids don't understand, and then he had a sibling who certainly didn't understand. He wasn't old enough to understand, and I just had this idea, and I'm like, you know what? I need to put out a children's book about this boy having sickle cell and having a sibling sibling who doesn't understand what sickle cell is, 
and why it's happening and why mom and dad have to spend time away and at the hospital and all of that and put it in a childlike manner. And that's what I did. So I actually wrote um, in 2014 or 13, I can't remember now, my brother has sickle cell. And so actually I got input from my younger son um, and asked him, like, what were some of the things that you remember dealing with, you know, while your brother was also dealing with his situations? How did it make you feel? What did you think? What questions did you have? And so he kind of helped me with the dynamics of the book, like, you know, one day, you know, my brother and I could be outside playing, you know, in the front yard, and then the next day my brother's not there. He's at the hospital. I don't know why. And so that's how that idea really um, came about. And um, so I published the book through Author House Publishing, and the book is um, actually available on Amazon and uh, barnesandnoble.com. And honestly, uh, when I wrote the book, I didn't write the book thinking about book sales and becoming a millionaire and being on the New York best-selling time. I wrote the book for people who were like us or who are like us, who Mm -hmm. don't have, who may not have resources, who may have other children who don't understand the disease or just something to be able to help them understand you know, from uh, a different, you know, type of perspective. And so I, um, after I published the book, I took the book to the hospitals and talked to, um, you know, social workers and different people in the hospitals, uh, you know, really to offer the book kind of for free, you know, even though the book is for sale, but just to let people know that there is a resource out there. It actually exists and this could be helpful. And so, so many people have responded back and said, wow, this really helped. You know, my kids really enjoyed it. We sat down as a family and we were able to read it together. Um, you know, now my, you know, son or daughter or whatever has have a better understanding of, you know, what this means and what it looks like and, you know, really just seeing the impact of it. And so that's actually um, where that idea came from. And so I was thinking about doing a sequel, maybe doing a second one, possibly. I'm not sure yet, but, um, you know, just want to continue to impact the lives of people and, and help people as they're dealing with, um, dealing with these things. So, yeah, that's where that came so from. So thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I will make sure that I put, um, you know, that information in the show notes. So if anyone is interested In purchasing the book, uh, the uh, information will be in the show notes so they can um, go right to Amazon and check out. (laughs) Um, Before I let you go, this is a question that I ask everyone on the show. Um, What do you think is the one thing that we can do, you know, as people in this space, that would help to create a little more peace in the world? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, so I would just say there's, there's a lot of things that, that we could do, but I think the number one thing is to be more concerned with the well-being of others. Be, be the light, you know, and, and I know we see that a lot. You know, be, be, the, be the light that, you know, you want others to see. But I really think that that holds true. We have to be the light that actually shines and help people because there's a lot of people who are living in darkness. There's a lot of people who have um, lots of things that they're dealing with that they don't know how to deal with. And there are many of us who have resources to help. And so we have to be the voice for those who are voiceless. And I think that just comes with being nice to people, offering a helping hand to people, sometimes just offering to do things for free, you know, not always thinking about money and, you know, um, charging and doing that, but just really being more of a resource for those who, who may not have the resources available to them. I think that's just really important, helping other people. 
Wow. Because, you know, yeah, I, I think that's it, especially with all the darkness that's going on. We just have to, there's always, you know, out of 10 people, there needs to be two or three that's just willing to step up. Thank you so much. Uh, I have learned so much today, and I'm sure our listeners have also, Dr. Gamble. So I really want to thank you for being with us today, for sharing your your knowledge and your story, and also for, you know, bringing a little black girl magic to the show. Um, you are, you know, an, an example of what, you know, can happen when you... You know, just make your mind up that I'm going to do it, and I am. I re- failure is not an option, and so I really, you know, applaud your efforts and and the effort um, that you extend to our communities, um, both in Cleveland and here in Atlanta. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank work. you for having me. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure, and I'm happy to do it. And like you'll put the notes in there, but if people want to reach out to me as well for you know any additional insight or uh, volunteer services, something that they may, may need help or assistance with, you can put my information out there as well. Awesome! I sure will. I sure will. If you want, can you give us your email address or uh, sure. your yep. website? Absolutely. So you can reach me at. Um, my email is Dr. Gamble, so drgamble1972 at gmail.com. And then um, my phone number is 678-600-4568. Those will probably be the two best ways to reach me. Um, if you send, shoot me an email or a text message or leave me a voicemail, then I'd be um, sure to get back to you that way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and um, everyone, that's the end of our show for today, but um, check out the show notes. All of Dr. Gamble's information will be in the show notes uh, if you need to reach her or if you want to purchase her book. um, I will be sure to add that information in also, and uh, thank you for being with us, and I'm just in awe. I don't know. <laughs> of all the information that you gave us. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Caregiving is a constant learning experience. Vivian Frazier. Hey, truth seekers. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on today's episode. You can comment below or shoot me an email, reneereed at reneereed.net. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at I am Renee Reed. So let's connect there. Hey, have you subscribed yet? Come on, join the family. We would love to have you, and I don't want you to miss one episode of this podcast. Did you know that becoming a monthly donor is a great way to keep the flow of ideals moving and changing our world? I can't do what I do without you, so thank you in advance. And don't forget to share this episode with someone you love. Until next time, remember, you are stronger than you give yourself credit and more blessed than you know. We'll talk soon. Bye.